Sai wipes away your tears. But actually, he brings tears to your eyes. When you talk of him, how can you not be in tears? He means so much to each one of us. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, is our life worth saving? Let us make something out of our life so that the Lord's efforts will not go in vain. Let us offer our lives completely to Him. That is why this program is called Samarpan. Offering my loving pranams at Bhagwan's lotus feet, respected elders and dear brothers and sisters. It gives me a very nostalgic feel to come back to Dharmakshetra. I had come to Dharmakshetra long back, twice with Bhagwan in the year 1975 when I was a student and in the year 1988 when I was a research scholar. And so when I come here, various points in this place evoke a lot of beautiful memories. It's always delightful to dwell on the memories of the Lord. The scriptures talk of four beatitudes. They talk of salokyam, that is, being in the same world as the Lord, samipyam, coming close to the Lord, sarupyam, getting the likeness of the Lord, and sayujyam, becoming one with the Lord. In fact, these are the four steps that one goes through. First, the privilege of being contemporaries of the Lord. Among the millions of stars and planets and galaxies that you have, to be born in the same loka as the Lord, Salokyam, must be, it's one of the greatest privileges that one can get, Salokyam. And to be born on earth and to come to the physical presence of the Lord, Samipyam is too great a blessing to imagine that it happened because of some punyam or something like that. It must be the Lord's mercy that brings you close to Him. When you live with the Lord, when you see Him, when you look into His eyes, feel His love in your heart, you cannot but adore Him and want to be like Him. That is Sarupyam. And then you have Sayujyam. You want to merge in the Lord. You don't want to be separate from Him because that is the sweetness that the Lord is. Actually, if we take life, life is like water. Insipid water, which is there in a glass. There is divinity present as sugar at the bottom of this glass. When the avatar comes, the avatar is like a spoon which stirs up the sugar which is there at the bottom of this life of yours and converts your entire life into a beautiful syrup. Life is no longer insipid. Life is not something that you just have to live somehow, manage to live. It becomes so beautiful that you are looking forward to meet the Lord at every turn of the road. Every moment, the Lord has something beautiful to give you. As they say, the Lord is full of joy, anand. And when you live your life with His love saturating your life, nothing can be more blissful. Life becomes a celebration. It's no longer somehow we have to live this life, no. It becomes such a celebration. But don't get me wrong. Don't think that the moment we come to God, there are no problems, there are no difficulties, there are no troubles. 
In fact, all this will come, maybe in greater measure. You know, when you come to Swami, your problems become more. Your troubles become more. The reason is, when the teacher is very good, the question papers become stiffer, tougher. Because the Lord is sure you will pass. You, he has taught you, so you are going to pass and therefore troubles will come. But what look like troubles for others are actually wonderful opportunities for us. Because one more chance you get to remember Him. That's why Kunti prayed to the Lord when he asked, Auntie, what do you want? At the end of the Mahabharata war, when after so many years of trials and tribulations and difficulties, he asked her, Auntie, what do you want? She said, give me difficulties. This, he was amazed. He said, have you not gone through enough of them? She said, no, no, Krishna. When difficulties come, I think of you. And when I think of you, I am happy. Therefore, please give me difficulties. And that is why every agony which becomes, which comes to your life becomes an opportunity. It becomes one more chance to experience the sweetness of the Lord's love. And that is why living the life of a devotee is the greatest opportunity, it is the greatest blessing. But as I was telling you, how do we come into the Lord's uh, focus? How do we get this privilege of allowing Him to enter our heart? We talk of entrance exams, right? We have so many entrance exams. You want to, today, if you want to go and join a first standard or a nursery, they say there's an entrance exam. Of course, it's more for the parents than for the kid. The entrance exam is just to see whether the parents can afford. But when we want the entrance exam, when we want the Lord to enter our heart, we make it so tough for Him, really. We make it so difficult for Him. And not only that, we are not satisfied with one entrance exam. He enters our heart, then we say, okay, one more CIE, continuous internal evaluation, one more slip test, one more mid-semester. We keep on testing him like that. But the Lord is patient. And he decides to save you. It's that. So how did he enter my life? Our life, I should say. In fact, one of the most wonderful experiences is to go around devotees and ask them, how did you come to Swami? And you know, every story will be so unique. Every story will be so beautiful. The Lord comes in unique ways and just like only He can be. You know, there are millions of flowers in this world. You see, every single flower is unique. Just like that, when the Lord enters your life, that the entrance itself is a beautiful experience. But it all starts in a very worldly sense, in a difficult way. In fact, when we first came to Swami, it was like this. My father had fallen sick. And this was in the 60s. Having fallen sick, he went to a doctor. We had a family doctor. In those days, we had doctors who, who could look, of, look at you as an individual. Today, you don't have doctors who look at you as an individual. They look at you as a part. There's a ear doctor, an ENT specialist. A ENT specialist who will, who will only look at your left ear. We have that kind of specialization. But in those days, there was family doctors. And these doctors used to be so good. They, you could go to them for any ailment. And this doctor whom we had, a family doctor, gave my father a mixture. Medicine used to be called a mixture those days. They had huge bottles in which they had some color-color liquids, you know, fluorescent, pink, fluorescent, green. And uh, the doctor would write something and give, and there would be somebody to dispense a compounder. And this compounder would mix it and give the medicine. Now, the beauty of that medicine was, once you drank it, you would never want to fall sick again. It would be so bitter 
that you would say, no, no, even if you have fever, you will say, no, I think I'm, I don't have fever. It used to be so bitter. So, the compounder gave the medicine. My father drank that for three days. And after three days, uh, he was fine. A week later, again he got temperature, went to the doctor. The doctor gave some other medicine, some other combination. And this happened for two, three more times. Now in those days, the doctors used to be very humble. Now this doctor looked at my father and said, look, this is something beyond me. I think I should refer you to a friend of mine who has started an institute called a Silver Jubilee Institute. So you just show him, go to him, let him examine you. So the doctor uh, examined my father and said, we will have to send a tissue for biopsy. So there was a procedure, tissue was sent for biopsy. At that time, we didn't understand that everything that happens, happens in a very, very beautiful way. When you put the pieces together later on, then you understand what it is. We didn't understand what the Silver Jubilee Institute was all about. We only knew that the doctor had uh, inaugurated this on the 25th anniversary of something. When the results came, the doctor called my father and said, you know, I must tell you this, you have cancer. In those days, telling you had cancer was almost like telling, pack your bags, one-way ticket. It was like saying, uh, call your relatives. And so, my father became very scared. And the doctor said, you have only a few more days to live. A doctor goes to your patient and says, I have good news and bad news, which do you want to listen? The patient says, Okay, sir, I am already suffering. Give me the good news. The doctor says, you have three weeks to live. Oh my God, if that is the good news, what's the bad news? I should have told this two weeks back. So that is how it is these days. So the doctor told my father, Mr. Tyagrajan, you have a few more days to live. But don't worry, I have a friend of mine who has opened a nursing home. It was called Surgical Nursing Home. He has just returned from England. He is an FRCS, a very brilliant surgeon, and he is up to date with the latest techniques. So he should be able to handle this. So you go and meet Dr. Kalappa. So my father went and met this gentleman, a bright young man, all of 35 years and uh, a very pleasant person. My father talked to him and the doctor said, oh, don't worry, I will, I will cure you. <laughs> I'll just do a procedure. They don't tell you operation because operation is scary. So procedure and it will be over in a few days. So my father said, okay. He got admitted and the doctor did the operation. Father came back home. And uh, after coming back home, uh, after a week he had to go for a review. When he went, the doctor said, uh, I think you must come back next week again. So when he went the next week, the doctor said, you know something, the first operation has not worked so well. We'll have to have one more operation. So, uh, father said, okay. I mean, you don't have a choice, right? So he said, okay. So my father went again and got admitted, got operated. Now this wonderful surgeon, you know, he was the best surgeon in Bangalore. You know, another way of saying, he's the costliest surgeon in Bangalore, okay. So he did the operation and the father returned back to home. A month later, again, he, was, he had to be admitted and the operation done. And the doctor was all confidence. He said, no problem. 
You know, it's only when you have problem, you say, no problem. Did you notice that? When somebody has problem, you say, don't worry, there's no problem. Means he has a problem. So the doctor said, no problem. I know there are a lot of, there are a few doctors whom I know here. Without meaning any offense, there is a Subhashitani in Sanskrit, which talks about doctors. This must be almost thousand years old, the Subhashitani, which correctly depicts the situation in today's world. I don't know if it was like that that time. It is prophetic though. <laughs> it says, Namaste astu vaidyaha yamarajasya sahodaraha. Namaskar to the physician. He is Yama's brother. He is not just a brother, he is an elder brother. Why? Yamaha harati pranam. Yama, poor fellow, does his duty, takes away your life. Vaidyaha harati pranam dananicha. He takes your life and pickpockets you. This is, of course, in a lighter vein. But what I mean to say is, see, when a person goes to the doctor, one side you have the worry of the pain and the suffering, and the second time, second, uh, on the second, in this another angle, you have this mental stress whether you can afford, whether after you finish with the operation you will have a house to live, whether you'll have a scooter to drive, because you may have to sell that to pay the doctor. So this continued. My father had four operations, five operations, ten operations. It went on like that, like Sachin Tendulkar score. And it kept on increasing. I remember I was a small boy at that time. All that I could understand was, first my father was staying at home, going to the hospital, getting admitted, and coming back. After some time it became, my father was staying in the hospital and occasionally coming home. It was like that. So 10 operations, 15 operations, 20 operations, 25 operations. Now the doctor was sure that he doesn't, he can't handle this. So he called my sister. My sister was doing her MBBS at that time. He called her and said, uh, I have something to tell you, some something which I want to share with you. Your father is in advanced state of cancer. I have tried all that I know and uh, it's not succeeding. I cannot assure you of anything. He is going to pass away any time now. So why don't you take him home? Let him at least die in the uh, surroundings with all a few children around him because we didn't have a mother. Let him be with you and uh, let him pass away peacefully. Why should he be in this atmosphere of all this antibiotics and phenyl and all that? So my sister got him discharged and brought him home. You can understand the mental state of this sister of mine who was the eldest in the family, who was herself a student. She had not completed her studies. I was the youngest. I had just joined school, I think, a couple of years before that. She brought my father home, but went to the office, uh, went to the college in the afternoon because she had to attend the class. Sitting in a corner, she was very depressed. If father too passes away, who will take care of us? Because he was the only breadwinner in the family. And if he also dies, who will take care of her? That was the agony. And she was so depressed, sitting in one corner, crying, when a classmate of hers came to her and said, Kamakshi, I know what's your problem. But I also know somebody who can cure your father. So, come today itself we will go. So, after the classes, the Bangalore Medical College is just next to City Market, which is a bus stop. So, they went and from there, there was a direct bus to Whitefield. So, they went to Whitefield, had Swami's darshan. 
And because the buses were not frequent those days, like somebody said, in those days we had a lot of roads and no buses. Today we have a lot of buses and no roads in Bangalore. I'm sure it's true in Mumbai also. So the sister came back home very late. In those days it was not common for young girls to go out like that and come back late. So my father asked her, what happened? Why are you late? Then my sister said, uh, Father, I had, I had gone to see somebody. He is God. He will cure you. You come. My father said, what are you speaking? Then she explained to him, see, I went to see somebody called Sai Baba. He lives in a place called, in a suburb called Whitefield. And he is known to cure a lot of uh, such illnesses. He'll definitely cure you, you come. My father, in a typical uh, fashion in my mother tongue, podi podi idala namba mata, he said. You know, it's typical like, I don't believe all this nonsense. His logic was, see, I have always been a devotee of God. It is not as if I was an agnostic or did not believe in God. I was always a devotee of God and I have always been honest and sincere with my work. So if that God whom I have worshipped all these years is not going to save me, do you think this new Sai Baba is going to save me? No, no, I don't believe all this. And my sister tried her best. Father won't budge, he said, no, no. My time has come, leave me. But when God decides to save you, he decides to save you, that's all. It's not because of any good things we have done, merit we have done, not because of some achievement of ours that he is going to save us. He is going to save us because he is mercy incarnate. He has decided to save us, that's all. That's why in Lakshm Lalita Sasnamam, there is a beautiful phrase, Sarvagnya Sandra Karuna, compassion, causeless compassion it is. The compassion is not because of some cause, some achievement, some tapas you have done or something. So, a week later, a letter comes from my father's office. He was working in a central government agency. And the doctor says, uh, the letter says, please come to the office personally. You have not come for six months, so we don't know whether the salary is really going to you. So physically you have to appear and take the salary. My father was in a terrible plight. He was struggling, but at the same time he could not avoid going because salary had to be taken. So he went, travelled about 35 kilometres, caught three buses and went to that place. And when he went there, the director who was from Delhi called him, spoke to him and said, how are you now, Tyagraj and all that. And my father told him, the doctors have said that any minute I will die. Then the director said, you know, how did you come? I came by bus, sir. I had to catch three buses and come. Okay, do this. You know, there is a professor who has come from abroad who wants to see somebody called Sai Baba. I don't know Bangalore much. Since you know Bangalore very well, take this person with you. It seems it's in a place called Whitefield that Sai Baba recites, take him to that place, let him uh, look at him and then on the way back the car can drop you at home. What a bait. You might tell your daughter, I don't believe all this nonsense. Can you tell your boss? You can't tell your boss. And as they say, it is a two in one offer. You can't refuse the boss and the boss is saying the car will drop you at home. Wow, that is another attractive offer. So father said, okay. So from there, they went to Whitefield. They had absolutely no idea of Swami, Darshan, Darshan timing, nothing. So as they entered the gates of Vrindavan, they found that Swami was returning after Darshan. He was going through the inner gates. My father had told in... Uh, told my sister, I don't believe all this nonsense and all that, but 
when the sai baba uh, name came back into the conversation somehow something you know stirred in his heart you know they say a dead man clutches at a straw the slightest hope you get you want to hang on to it so he was happy but he saw swami going away from him he said there my hopes are receding at that time brindavan was full of trees very beautiful place and this other professor who had come said it is so peaceful here let's we have come so far let's sit down here for some time and one of the volunteers came to him and said you know baba comes for darshan only in the evening after 5 so you can go and come back in the evening they said we will sit for a few minutes and go they they were just sitting there when suddenly the gates opened and swami came out swami came out straight to where they were sitting straight and uh, as he was approaching them even when he was about 10 feet away swami was talking something so my father immediately looked at the professor you know he is the devotee i don't know him at all it must be to him but swami was talking in a indian language swami is talking in kannada swami is asking why did you have 25 operations now my father knew it must be him only the doctor is saying that you will die because of cancer isn't it no your cancer is cancelled swami said created prasadam and gave it to him and my father was so thrilled that uh, he knew somebody telling for the first time he is come and baba walks straight to him and says your cancer is cancelled how does he know i have cancer how does he know i underwent 25 operations if he knows this much he must be powerful enough to cure me see that was the faith and swami blessed him and returned back and returned to the mandir my father came home he told all of us and we were all jubilant one week later he had gained enough strength to go back to office and he was completely cured completely cured of cancer he went back to work and he continued his work in fact he retired in that job he came to swami uh, he became a samiti convener he came to swami one day for a interview with many people to prashanti nilayam and swami looked at them and said tomorrow i'll talk to you now the next day happened to be my father's retirement day so my f- father said if swami has told he is talking to me i'll be there and so he stayed there swami called them for interview he looked at my father and said what are you doing now my father said swami i am supposed to retire today uh, the government has asked me to go on a deputation to iran swami said no 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 times are not good there don't go now i will give you a job and so swami took him to brindavan in the sanatan sarthi press my father joined in the press he worked there when the press shifted to prashanti nilayam my father also shifted he stayed there and he lived and when he passed away he passed away because of old age how old was he he was 89 years when he died <laughs> swami had not only cured him swami had extended his life by 39 years some years back i had gone to uh, england i was speaking in cardiff to a group of surgeons when i finished speaking one of them came to me and said you know what a miracle this is ravi kumar you know what a fantastic thing you know i have been a surgeon for many years for almost two and a half decades he said when we try to prolong a person's life a cancer patient's life by a month or a couple of months we think it's a great achievement and swami cured your father without any 
any chemotherapy or anything like that and gave him a lease of life of 39 years which is which is possible only for god that's what he said now how did my uh, father die that's also very interesting you know he was staying in prashantinilayam he he was staying in the second floor and even at that age 88 years 89 years he used to come up and down almost 10 12 times in a day my sister is asking him why are you going down up and down he said no no exercise i need i need exercise i must go so he used to go up and down go for darshan perfectly he was fine on the last day it so happened that for a week towards the end i happened to stay with my father because my sister's husband had passed away in bangalore and so she had to come there for the rites and all that so i was staying with him i asked swami swami said okay stay and so i was cooking for my father i don't know much of cooking okay a few years before that swami was pulling my leg he said you must get married i said swami i am happy swami why do you want me to get married then swami said no no who will take care of your father i said i will take care no who will cook for him swami i'll cook for him do you know cooking no swami i will learn so on that uh, remark of swami i learned cooking and in fact one day swami asked me a year later hey have you learned cooking he asked me it was a bouncer i said yes swami what can you make he said i said i can make chapati i can make rice i can make that uh, you know the tomato onion curry easiest stuff and upma i can make so i said ah adi chalu is it that is enough so the last uh, week i was staying with my father i started cooking after 2 3 days i got fed up of my cooking i told my father i'll get you from the canteen he said no no you are cooking very well you cook so i was staying with him it was a sunday and uh, i was to return i told my father uh, after 6 o'clock i am going so my father came down as he was getting into the car he told me something very sweet he said uh, shall i get you a pair of clothes he asked me i said why swami has given me lots of pairs of clothes then he said no no you took care of me so well he said i said you took care of me so well you brought me to swami can there be a greater blessing a parent can give a child than this but he said uh, okay can i at least pay for the taxi i said no why should you pay for the taxi it's my privilege to serve you swami has given me this privilege of serving you that is uh, i am very very thankful to swami for this but he was not satisfied you know the next day my sister was staying with him one sister who is a primary school teacher she had gone to bangalore and returned so he gave us some money and said put this in that fellow's account and come and tell me you have put so that was on monday on tuesday morning he got up at 4:30 he finished his bath he went for vedam naga sankirtan they have he had finished darshan came back to the room and uh, as he came back to the room he had his breakfast now small small details are so beautiful i tell you on the it was the last day of his life as he was going out he told my sister i am going for darshan and on the door of our house you know there was there is a small mirror my father had a habit of looking into the mirror and asking my sister is my hair properly combed you know and my sister knew it was a practice okay so she said without even looking at him he says it's properly combed and he came out as he came to the first floor he met somebody that person asked uncle where are you going so fast he said i am going for darshan came down to the ground floor looked at the ajur mandir swami had just moved into the ajur mandir couple of months before that it was in 2006 he did pranam 
said Sai Ram and fell down. And uh, the beautiful thing is, now I'm going to tell you something which even I didn't know for 11 years, which I got to know only a couple of, um, maybe three, four months back. There was a Sevadal person on duty. Now this gentleman, his name is Sukhdev Singh. He used to come for duty to Prashant Nilayam from Shimla, from Himachal. This year, in the month of March, when he had come, he called my sister and he said, are you not Tyagarajan's daughter? He said, yes, uncle, I am Tyagarajan's daughter. He said, I will tell you something that I have not told you all these years. It is a secret I kept within myself. But I want to share with you because I had a near-death experience recently and I want you to know this. <coughs> so she said, what is it? He said, when your father said Sai Ram and fell down, I was there on duty there at that gate, West One. And quickly I ran to that police chowk which is there and told them, you know, somebody has fallen down there. And they said, what can we do? You go and tell in the Sevadal office. He said, so I ran and when I came back, I was surprised to find Swami standing there. And Swami was blessing your father. And I was all agitated, more agitation because Swami has now come. I'm not on duty. I mean, I should have been there. And Swami turns to him and says, uh, why are you so agitated? Everything is fine. Everything is arranged, Swami tells him. Sab kuch arrange kiya hai, Swami tells. And then, Swami asks him, tumko kya chahiye? He says, Swami, humko moksh chahiye, Swami. Swami says, mamta chodo, moksh milega. And then he said something which was very strange. He said, Swami created a lingam and gave it to me. And for 12, for 11 years, I have worshipped this lingam. I wanted to tell you. My sister was surprised, shocked and delighted naturally. In the meanwhile, Swami and Swami returned. In the meanwhile, somebody ran, somebody had gone up to find out who this person is. And he found out, found my sister. He told her, uh, some person looks like your father has fallen down. So my sister came with a glass of water. He, she sprinkled the water, no reaction. In the meanwhile, somebody came with a stretcher. My sister didn't know all this Sukhdev Singh, whatever happened. She had not known. She didn't know. So she was agitated. She didn't know what to do. And this person brings the stretcher. She asked, how did you know he, pa he has fallen down? He said, the ambulance has just come to park. I found somebody has fallen, so I brought the stretcher. So they took my father to the hospital, and the doctor said, he's gone. And all that happened in a very, very short time. So this is how we got to know. But I was being a um, science student. Naturally, you know, you want evidence, right? My sister told me this. I asked my sister. She rang me up and said, you know, this gentleman by name Sukhdev Singh told this. I said, did you get his address? No. <laughs> did you get his phone number? No. <coughs> From which place is he? Himachal. I said, Himachal is a very big place. Okay, so we went to Dharmashala this year. We tracked him. We tracked him. And we found that he is from a village called Gelor. It is 100 kilometers from where we were staying. We put Google Maps, searched and went to his house, met him. And that is the photograph you see of the gentleman. He is a BSF a soldier. And then we asked him about the lingam. Swami has given you a lingam. In the beginning, he was very reluctant to show. Jo kuch diya, Bhagavan ne diya, he said. He said, no, no, we want to see it. And then, I don't know what moved him, he took out the lingam and showed, you can see that lingam in my sister's hand. That is the lingam Swami had given. So this is how, that's why I always say, when you have the God on, when you have God on your side, He not only takes care of your welfare, but also your farewell. <laughs> takes care of your farewell, He makes it such a beautiful experience. You know, when you get to know that Swami was present, how can you feel bad about such an experience? You feel this is the greatest blessing that anybody can get. 
I have had many opportunities to speak about this experience in Swami's presence, in Swami's physical presence. One day when I finished this and sat down, Swami said, Sariga Chepaledu, you didn't tell this properly. Now this was an experience which if you wake me at midnight, I can tell you without missing a single uh, full stop comma. So many times I've narrated this, I was surprised. But I, uh, how do you ask Swami, Swami, what, what did I miss? So I just waited and Swami said, you missed out an important point, he said. You know what that is? You did not tell this. When your father went to that surgeon, what did he tell? Swami said. Swami said that he will cure my father. Swami said, do you know this? The surgeon died before your father. <laughs> of course, because the surgeon's son-in-law happened to be my sister's uh, colleague, she had known that he had passed away. But we had never related this, this way. And that is how we came to Swami. He chose to enter our lives like that. That's how we came to Swami. So another day, when I was narrating about this, I said, so that is how we came to Swami in 1968. Swami looked at me and said, 1968 Kadu, 1963, he said. Now, when you are with Swami, you know that you cannot inform the all-knowing. You don't correct him and say, no, no, you are mistaken. <laughs> because whatever he says is the truth. All that you can pray is that he throws light for even our dull intellect to make out what it is. I didn't say anything. Then Swami said, Ravi, you remember the day your mother passed away? He asked me. I said, very clearly, Swami. I was just about four years and a few months. Then Swami said, what happened that evening? I said, Swami, I don't remember what happened that evening, specific evening. Do you remember anything, Swami said? I said, yes, Swami, I remember my mother's body. I remember the sari she was wearing. I remember that everyone was sad around me. I was very, was very moving around happily. Then Swami said, your cousin came to you and spoke to you, no? He said. There was a cousin of mine who was just about two months elder to me. And as they were preparing to remove my mother's body, he came to me and said, hey, you know something? They are going to take your mother in procession. I was excited because we lived near a temple and you know, those temple processions were a common sight. It was full of jubilation and firecrackers and music and Nadaswaram and all that. So, I thought that was the procession. I was very excited. Now, this cousin of mine said, but one thing, they won't bring her back. The moment he said this, I burst into tears and nothing would console me. So, an aunt of mine, took me to her house, which was just across the street. Swami is telling all this, okay. Took me across to the, her house. As soon as I entered her house, I saw Swami's photograph there. I asked her, Yar in the mommy, I asked. Who is this auntie? She said, the mommy, lapa, Swami. <laughs> this is not an aunt, this is God. She said, you pray to him, he will take care of you. Swami told this and said, Do you know, Ravi, from that time I am taking care of you. So you came to me in 1963. <laughs> For those who wonder whether Swami is present in the photograph, this is enough. You just have to go and tell him in front of the photograph and he is listening to you. I have had a number of experiences of this. Maybe some other time. Okay, as uh, life progressed, I joined a school. This school was very famous uh, because it was 100 years old. In fact, when I was in my 8th standard, I joined the school and the school was celebrating its centenary celebrations. 
the school was very special for me because my uncle had read my father had read my uncle's cousin had read and so on long uh, list of people had read there so they said this is the school for you now you know what happens to institutions over 100 years this school had uh, the structure was intact the building was there but the discipline had deteriorated in fact the first day i went to school i found in the school that uh, there were some people who looked young enough not to be teachers but old enough not to be in the class there were four people and as soon as we finished our morning session these four boys called all of us new entrants and said we want to talk to you we thought there must be some seniors uh, inspecting or something so we we went to them and they said look uh, I, we want to tell you something very important pay attention you see across the ground what do you see they said now this school had many specialities one of it was across the ground there were three movie theaters and it was those days when movies didn't come to you in your mobiles you had to go to a movie theater to see a film so they said you see those three theaters if you want to learn english go to a english film if you want to learn kannada go to a kannada film if you want to learn hindi go to a hindi film if you go there you will get kannada or hindi or english whatever if you sit in the class what will you get except sleep nothing you will get so every day go and attend there so we used to give attendance here and attend there this had become a practice you know as as was mentioned i was in the first batch of balvikas so on thursdays white dress vibhuti and all that and i would go to the uh, samiti and uh, sing bhajans and uh, the balvikas teacher would even tell the others you should all become like ravi and i used to think poor fellows <laughs> they become like me but nobody knew this part of my life so every day in a week we used to see seven films because there are six working days but on saturday we used to go for a morning show and a matinee because one day will get wasted education has no it should be continuous so we used to go every day and uh, my father was very busy see after this got cured of cancer when he went back to the office he found that they had assumed that he will not return so they had promoted lot of people who were junior to him above him so he had to take orders from them he was heart broken and he was working very hard so he would go at 7 in the morning come back at 8 in the night i was leading this kind of existence my sisters were also students so they didn't know about this part one day it happened that my father came back early 5 o'clock he came back and i came at thinking that he'll come at 8 i came at 7 and he said why are you late i said special class there was one more classmate with me and he was aghast after my father went he said how can you bluff like this i said what what do you mean bluff what i told was the truth it was a white lie he said how do you justify this i said look in our class do we have sofas we don't have here we have do you have air condition in the classroom no no here we have so it's a special class that's what i meant so this fellow said totally incorrigible fellow you are nothing will save you and so life was going on merrily i thought it would be like this and i would continue my education like this nobody would know naturally my grades were not good but you know the school had one beautiful uh, means tradition they would just not send details of your marks to parents they would only say pass fail so suppose you get pass you can always say your first rank who is going to know 
managing life like this, one day I went to Brindavan with my father. And Swami came out for darshan. When Swami came out for darshan, he looked at my father and said, go inside. So my father was very excited, got up and said, come, we'll go. And I looked at my father because I understood that this was an interview. Somebody had told me, you know, when Swami calls you for an interview, it's a fantastic thing. I said, what is fantastic about it? Interview me, they'll ask you questions, you have to answer like that. He said, no, 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 it's not like that. When you go for an interview, Swami won't ask you any question. He will just tell you the answers because he knows everything about you. This was too scary. <laughs> Suppose he starts giving answers. So I was hesitant to go. And my father was very excited and he was tugging me. And you know, the moment Swami calls you for an interview, everyone looks up at you. Such a good fortune, lucky fellow, like that. So I went in and we were standing there. Swami finished darshan and came back. I was the first in the row. Now there's a straight line in front of the interview room. I was the first in the line. Swami looked at me, patted me on my cheeks and looked at my father and said, good boy, he said. That day I tell you, I was in the 17th heaven of bliss. Because if Swami tells you are a good boy, everyone is going to tell you are a good boy. Okay. The second thing was, I said, even Swami does not know. <laughs> Till now, somewhere lurking in the mind was that worry that, suppose he knows, and now he has confirmed he doesn't know. So I was very, very happy. The moment I thought like this, Swami called my father and asked, where are the other members of the Samiti? Swami, they are sitting there. Go and call them, Swami said. Sent my father. Then he called me. Come here. He said, good boy. He said, I smiled. Okay. And then Swami asked, good boy? So what was a question mark? What was a ex full stop now became a question mark? So I said, I kept quiet. Are you a good boy? He said. I kept quiet. You know, in Balvikas, they teach you all the silent sitting and all that. It comes in handy. <laughs> Such moments, I was thinking, I am not giving any details. <laughs> there was no RTI and all those days. So, Swami asked me, are you a good boy? Where were you yesterday? I said, uh, Swami, yesterday was a Saturday. See, unnecessary information. <laughs> yesterday was a Saturday. Swami said, Nag Telsu. I know. Where were you yesterday? I kept quiet. Why, uh, why volunteer unnecessary information? Nain Chepana, Swami said, shall I tell you? I was thinking inside, why not? If you know, why not? And Swami said, you were in Ajanta Theatre. God. You were with your classmates in the last but one row. My first shock was, oh, he knows about Ajanta Theatre. <laughs> I mean, there's a theatre called Ajanta Theatre. He knows that. And second thing, he's telling the exact coordinates where I was sitting. <laughs> and then Swami says, all three of you were watching Katti Patang. Asha Parekh, Rajesh Kanna. You want any more information? At that moment, through the corner of my eye, I am seeing my father coming. <laughs> Why would I want any more information? <laughs> my worry was, he might give some information to my father. That he might really tell him that my life is a katti patang. <laughs> Aimless, rudderless, being buffeted by all kinds of winds, going hither and thither without any direction. The moment my father came, Swami looked at me, smiled, looked at my father and said, he is a good boy. <laughs> at that moment, it was not a time for information, it's a time for transformation. That time had come in my life. 
you know, Swami says, what's the difference between information and transformation? When you're going, go around and ask people, who are you, who are you? That is information. When you start asking, who am I, who am I? That is transformation. So Swami told that, and then by that one act of Swami, this is what he did. He tied my heart to his lotus feet and gave me a direction in life so that the same winds lifted me in the sky. So that's what happened to my life. Swami called us for interview after that. <laughs> that is one interview I don't remember anything about. I kept on asking, can there be somebody like this? Can there be somebody who is omniscient and so loving? He could have told my father, you know this fellow, do you think he's a good fellow? He goes all the time to films. He could have told him that. And my father's reaction would have been, he would have fallen, Sastang Pranam, he would have done and said, Swami, you are God. That would have been the reaction. But what did Swami do? He cared more for my honor, my heart, than for my father's worship. So I said, if somebody is so loving and so omniscient, he must be God. And so the rest of my life, I am going to spend only serving him and worshipping him. He is my God. I don't know about other gods who are there in pictures in my house. This God, he is walking amidst us. He is my God. And from that day to this day, he has been the center of my life. And what a beautiful journey it has been. When I look back at the tapestry of my life, I see from that point onwards, there are golden strands which have been interwoven into my life. Everything has become such a beautiful experience. That is why Swami is worshipped in the Ashtotam as Subhnana Marga Darshakaya Namaha. He shows you the right path. In fact, when uh, on the 25th of May 1947, he wrote a letter to his brother. Seshama Rajagaru had written a letter to Swami saying that, Satya, you don't know the world. People are coming and taking you to their places. They are all selfish. Don't get pulled here and there. Don't get fooled. Then Swami wrote a letter which is actually addressed to all those who love me, to all of us. It was actually a blueprint for the avatar in that Swami says, Akila manavaluku ananda munagur chirakshinch chundute dikshanaku. I have taken a diksha. That I will give happiness to the entire world. Not happiness, ananda to the entire world. Akila manavaluku, it is not this, this family or that family or that community or that nation, but the entire world. Then the second part, in fact, that is what happens, isn't it? The super specialty hospitals are places which rid you of dis-ease. So they give you happiness back into your life. So, Akila manavaluku ananda munagurchi rakshinchu chundute dikshanaku sanmargamunu vidi charenchu varula chaipatti kapadute vratamunaku those who stray away from the right path, I hold them by the hand and bring them to the right path. That is what Swami did. That's what Swami has been doing. In all our lives, that is what Swami has been doing. Somebody asked Swami this, Swami, why do you say, I will hold them by the hand and bring them to the right path? Is it not enough if you simply say, see, this is the right path, go along this path? Swami said two reasons. One thing is, they are blinded by ignorance. So when you show a blind person a path, what do you do? You hold him by the hand and lead him. The second thing Swami said, the path to the divine is a very narrow path. He said, the path to hell is an expressway. Okay. Six lane highway, eight, eight lane highway. Why? Too much traffic <laughs> that side. But the path leading to heaven is a very narrow path. So I have to hold by the hand and bring you to the right path. And that is how Swami led us, led me to, the, to this path. And he gave that Kati Patang, which was my life, 
direction by tying it to his lotus feet. That became the turning point in my life. And when you pray to the Lord, Rahadika, O Bhagwan, he shows you the path. In fact, I didn't even pray, but he showed me the path. And the path, of course, is the path of light, the path which leads you to light, the path which will turn you into light. See, that is the beauty. He turns your life in itself into a street lamp. So I used to say those days, I take street dogs and make them street lamps. Okay, take street dogs and make them street lamps. So that is what Swami has done. Okay. So I joined uh, Swami's college in 1974. To be very honest, I have just started. Okay. So I came to Brindavan College, joined for my intermediate course. Now as I was doing this intermediate course, you know, there are various fears that come into your life. My greatest fear was mathematics. You know, nothing of it made sense to me. And uh, I used to be very scared of this. There was a professor who, who had uh, retired from Andhra Pradesh. He came and taught us, Professor Ranganayaklu, a brilliant professor, but he didn't enter my skull. In fact, I decided to shift from the front row to the back row, would give others chance. <laughs> and you know, always there are people in the class who will shake their head so much that the teacher thinks everyone knows. They will shake on behalf of everyone. <laughs> so there were some classmates of mine that, and the teacher had a short sight. So he could see only the front bench. And he thought that we have understood everything. He used to take mathematics class. Finally, the end of the year came. And uh, as the day's mathematics exam is nearing, the blood pressure, temperature, everything is rising. But you know, in those days, the beautiful thing was, before the exam, you can go up to Swami's room and take namaskar. You can straight walk up to Swami's room. When I studied in the hostel, we had just about 65 students. So Swami knew each one of us by name. Not only name, he knew the dress that we used to wear. He will ask, why is that fellow wearing this fellow shirt? You know, that thoroughly Swami knew. And he would also say, oh, do bhi sariga tisko rale da, he used to say. So Swami knew every one of us and we could walk into Swami's uh, upstairs anytime. So that day I went and I told myself, one namaskar and this can be fixed. So I went there and to take namaskar. As I entered the room, I found that Swami was in Ruddhakar. He was very angry. There was a caretaker of Vrindavan Ashram by name Mr. Ram Brahmam. A you know, portly gentleman and uh, he was a terror for everybody. In fact, from the mandir if he says watchman, if he says the watchman will get up and tie his shoelace wherever he is. But this man in front of Swami is so humble. And Swami was scolding him. Swami was scolding him, I don't know for what. And just at that moment I entered. And I straight away came into Swami's radar. Swami said, Noora Ikra, he said, come here. So I came. Then he said, you tell me, how much money do you get from home? Simple question, I said, Swami, I get 65 rupees every month. Uh, sorry, 100 rupees every month. Yendu Kanta, he said, why do you get so much money? Now today, 100 rupees, if you give it to a beggar, he'll look somewhat at you. <laughs> In those days, 100 rupees had some value. I said, Swami, 65 rupees, mess bill. I thought I had tied it over the difficulty. Swami said, ah, 65 rupees, mess bill, he said. I knew the poor warden, I was trying to raise that from 65 rupees to 70 rupees for months together. And Swami said, nothing doing. Finally, he convinced Swami one day. And he came to the hostel very happy and he asked for the mic to be arranged. And the AVC boys were arranging. Then somebody came and told, sir, Swami is calling you. So he went back and Swami asked, uh, Ray PM Roju, he asked, what is tomorrow? Swami, tomorrow is Ugadi, Swami. Do you want to give boys this? Bad news on Ugadi day, Swami said. Nothing doing, keep it at 65. 
So for years together it was 65 rupees. And then what happened? Swami said, okay, 65 rupees. What do you do with the other 35 rupees? Give me an accounts chepu. I thought mathematics exam, <laughs> that itself is scary and he is asking for accounts now. So I said, Swami, uh, haircut. How many times do you have a haircut in a month, he said? Only once. Then I tried hair oil, soap. And Swami asked, how many soaps do you use in a month? Our complexion says it all. <laughs> so at the end of it, I could manage only about 9 rupees or 10 rupees. You know, in those days, things were cheap. I wish it was like today, you could have said one soap and it would have covered the entire thing. And Swami said, hmm, 25 rupees yen just to now? Then he scolded me. Left and right he scolded me, said, your father is struggling there to earn and you're wasting money like this? Very bad. Misuse of money is evil, he said. And just at that time, the bell rang for the exam. <laughs> now the next uh, building was the college in those days, next to Mandir. So Swami looked at me and said, exam unda? He asked, do you have exam? I looked at Swami strangely. I said, is it an ordinary exam? You know, they have this uh, advertisement, it's not a car, it's a car, like that. <laughs> so it's not an exam, it's a mathematics exam. Swami is asking it so lightly. I said, Swami, mathematics exam only. Oh, no. Breakfast chesava, he said. Did you have breakfast? No, Swami. Go to the hostel, eat your breakfast and go to the exam, he said. One thing I had learnt, when Swami tells anything, just do it. No questions asked. So I did namaskar, went to the hostel, had a breakfast, had my breakfast and went back. Went back to the exam hall. Now when I went to the exam hall, outside the mathematics teacher was waiting. And he said, Ravi Kumar, what happened? Twenty minutes late. I said, sir, big story, sir, I'll tell you afterwards. And he said, yes, yes, go quickly, otherwise they won't give question paper. If you go after half an hour, they don't give. So I went inside the exam hall and the question paper was given. I looked at the question paper and wow. I immediately prayed for the welfare of that examiner, whoever set that paper. He had set out of 13 theorems, no, 8 theorems he had given that year. And theorems, no, you just get by heart and vomit. So I said, oh, it's very easy, I can, chalo, I can finish this. Started writing the first theorem. Somewhere along the line, you know, these mathematicians have the strange habit of putting let x is equal to something. That something I could not remember. What is that something? What is that something? I'm looking at the watch, it's already one hour. And first question I have not answered, eight questions to be answered. So I went to the second question. But my heart was with the first question. So second question also successfully I spoiled. So I went to third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth question I was writing when the b final bell rang and the invigilator asked paper, paper, paper like that. I looked at my paper and I thought, <laughs> this was the thought I said, I looked at the invigilator and said, my gain is your loss. <laughs> and I gave it to him because the paper was full of debris of fractured theorems. Not one of them was complete. I came out of the exam hall. And the mathematics teacher was standing outside. I was touched. I told him, sir, I am very touched. Yes, why? I said, sir, in no other college, the teacher comes before the student for the exam. You came before me and you have waited three hours and after three hours you are waiting to find out how I did. How kind of you, sir, I am very moved. He said, no, no, not like that, Ravi Kumar. Don't jump to conclusions. He said, if you pass, we will get 100% <laughs> results. That's why I waited, he said. <laughs> so I sat with him and we, I told him, sir, this exam, this, this question I have answered this much. This question I have answered this much. Told him everything like this and finally told him, Sir, will I pass? He took a hanky and wiped his bro. And he said, you know, this paper is written by 40,000 to 50,000 students. We don't know where your paper will go, who will correct. But one thing is sure. 
If the examiner to whom your paper goes, on that day his wife has not scolded him, he is in a good mood, and his children have not troubled him, he comes there, he may even give you 35 marks. In those days, 35 was the pass mark. So I said, wow. I came back. So there is a chance that I will pass, but you know, that was the last exam, and uh, the whole holidays, inside, you know, I'm so worried, if I fail, what will happen? If I fail, what will happen? Now, luckily at that time, Swami brought me to Dharmakshetra. We had come for a drama, Bajagovindam drama, it was in the year 1975, May. That was the time when the stupa was inaugurated. The Sarva Dharma Aikya Prema stupa was inaugurated. So, I will come to that a little later. You know, it was a beautiful experience. In fact, uh, that's why when I moved around in Dharmakshetra today, so many memories, so many memories. Uh, so, on the last day, Swami took us for sightseeing. You know, we went all over Bombay with Swami and Swami showed us various places. If I have time, I'll narrate that. And then, as Swami is getting down from the bus near her Juhu, in the night, Swami said, you all go directly because we were staying at the Bharati Vidyavaban campus, Andheri West. And Swami was coming this side. Swami said, you all go directly. He looked at me and said, no Puttapati kira, he said. Come to Puttapati. So Swami was coming to Brindavan and going to Pati immediately. I came to Brindavan, went to Pati. And uh, we had bhajan that day. After the bhajan, Swami called us all upstairs. You know, when I, was, when I was a Balvika student, one day Swami had called me for interview. And uh, it's a very long this thing, but at the end of it, Swami told me, I'll perform your Upanayanam. So I was very happy. So I was waiting for Swami to perform my Upanayanam, and in my house, I was the eldest son in, uh, among all my cousins. So my grandfather said, Ravi, please tell Swami that uh, Swami should perform so that the others, you know, there's a long chain waiting. <laughs> Long line, so you tell Swami. So I said, Swami, uh, please perform my Upanayanam. Swami said, I'll speak to you in the evening. So in the evening, Swami called me for interview. When Swami called me for interview, Swami asked me, um, Hey, Ravi, ni came Kavali? He asked. What do you want? It was, it was, you know, people like Ravana and all had prayed for done tapas for so many years for the same question. You know, God appears in front of you and asks, what do you want? And then, of course, they have planned for their this thing and all. I had also planned whole holidays. Swami has yem kawali. I said, Swami, mathematics lo pass kawal, Swami. Yes. <laughs> for me, at that moment, you know, that was the biggest boon anyone could ask for. Swami, mathematics lo pass kawali, Swami. Swami said, cha, adayin dira, he said. That's over. Where am Kavali? What else do you want? I said, I don't want anything. <laughs> For me, there was nothing beyond that at that moment. One month later, the results came. And because we were a small uh, uh, group of students in the hostel, the principal had given our marks card to Swami. Swami would uh, read our marks, he would read our names and give it to us. He said, Ravi Kumar, and gave it to me. The next boy was Santosh. He said, Santosh, I was looking aghast because it's written past. So Swami looked at me and said, Chusava, he said. Did you see? Yes, Swami, I passed in. Passed, I said. Hey, mathematics mark, Chudu, he said. See the mathematics mark. It was 53. <laughs> then Swami tells me, Itla 53 was Tundira. How can you get 53? You have written for 35 marks, no, he said. I didn't say this. I didn't tell him at all about it. The teacher had told me, uh, under all those extraordinary circumstances, you'll get 35. <laughs> Swami said, 35 kras na wakada? Etla 53 o chindi? I said, I don't know. You have done something, Swami, I told him. <laughs> Swami said, yes. Inka mundu baga chadu. Study properly. And Swami said, from now onwards, baga chadu wali. I'll study well, Swami. Okay. Then what happened? That was my uh, 11th standard. I finished my 12th standard. 
The next issue was, what should I do? You know, there was this question which, uh, which was tormenting everyone's mind in the family. What should you do after 12th Even now, I think all parents, when the son or the daughter comes to 12th standard, they spend sleepless nights thinking about what to do next because that is the gateway to your future. So, in my house, we were a joint family. So many uncles and aunts and cousins and all that. Yes. So, there was a discussion. There was an uncle, there is an uncle, he is about 90 years old now, who had done about 20 degrees. He was the intellectual in the family. And so, everyone turned to him. He said, you must do CA. CA was the in thing those days. And another uncle was there, he was working in Hindustan Aeronautics. He said, no, 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 you do engineering. You know, it, engineering is, uh, we need a lot of good engineers, you do engineering. And my father said, in my opinion, you should do medicine. And his logic was very simple. You know what he said, your sister's books are there. I need not buy books again. <laughs> so you do medicine. But I had already given my heart to Swami. I didn't want to move out of Brindavan. But all elders are telling like this. So what do I tell? So I just ask them, you know, in our family, we had a lot of respect for elders. We would not back answer them. So I just said, after everyone finished, if Swami says something, can I do that? Everyone unanimously said, Swami is Supreme Court. Whatever Swami says, automatically that is the thing. That year, I went to Uti with Swami. There was this Uti summer course, 1976. One evening, some spokes in the wheel had gone wrong. You know, when you are with Swami, things are ne never as rosy as they appear. Lessons are always on the way. Okay, it's very beautiful after the experience, but during the experience it's quite tight. Swami had caught some of the boys talking, chatting. You know, one thing that Swami does, never liked was wasting time chatting. Okay, unnecessary talk. He never liked that. So he used to always tell us, maintain the vow of silence. Okay, then only you can think of God. Swami had caught one of, and so Swami is not talking to us. And all the attention he was giving our sisters, all that we should have got, they were getting, Swami is talking to them only and we were sitting here. We were totally non-existent for Swami. You know, Swami, that art he had perfected so much, I tell you, when he, when he ignores you, you yourself start getting doubt whether you are there. So perfect it will be. So, one day, I was sitting in the bhajan group, and there was this gentleman by name Sohan Lal. He was the state president of Delhi at that time. And he was speaking. And Swami was sitting here. I was sitting just about three feet away from Swami. And he said, how lucky you boys are. See, Swami decides everything for you. Swami decides what you should study. Swami decides uh, what uh, job you must do. Swami decides... He kept on saying that. And the irony hit me so much that I couldn't control myself. I, I laughed like, I laughed like that. Swami had not looked at me for, looked at us for 10 days, suddenly looked at me at that time. Looked at me like that. And I started thinking of what all things I have to pack. I went, went to the hostel, packed all my luggage, kept it ready. Now warden is going to come and he'll give you only two options. Do you want to go by the 7.15 bus or 7.30 bus? That's all it will be. So, the warden comes. And he looks at all of us, talks to everyone very happily and... Then I thought, maybe he didn't notice me. So I said, Sairam sir, I'm a warden no, now, I know what it means. <laughs> so he looked at me and said, Sairam Vikmar, he said, and he went off. He would definitely have not missed me if Swami had sent word. So, I don't know what happened, I got saved that night. So that night as I was lying down, Swami came in my dream and said, 
ఏ నెక్స్ట్ ఏది చేస్తే ఎంఎస్సీ చేయొచ్చో అది చేయి డూ దాట్ విచ్ విల్ హెల్ప్ యూ టు డూ ఎంఎస్సి లేటర్ సెట్ ఫైన్ సో సిఏ ఇస్ అవుట్ ఇంజనీరింగ్ ఇస్ అవుట్ మెడిసిన్ ఇస్ అవుట్ ఐ కెన్ బీ విత్ స్వామి వెరీ వెరీ హ్యాపీ ఐ సెంట్ టెలిగ్రామ్ టు మై ఫాదర్ సెయింగ్ గట్ స్వామి హెస్ చోజన్ దిస్ ఫామి ఓకే సో ఐ డిసైడెడ్ టు డూ బిఎస్సి ఇన్ బృందావన్ నౌ ది నెక్స్ట్ క్వశ్చన్ వాస్ వాట్ డూ డూ సైన్స్ ఆర్ కామర్స్ ఓకే ఐ డెన్ వాంట్ టు డూ కామర్స్ బికాస్ యూ హ్ టు షిఫ్ట్ స్ట్రీమ్ బట్ డూ యూ డూ బయో సైన్స్ ఆర్ డూ యూ డూ మ్యాథమెటిక్స్ నౌ దే వాస్ అ క్లాస్మేట్ ఆఫ్ బైన్ ఓకే హూ సెడ్ ఏ రవి కుమార్ యు ఆర్ వెరీ లక్కీ హీ టోల్డ్ మీ అసిమ్ వై వి ఆర్ డిసెక్టింగ్ అ ఫ్రాగ్ he said see i have been noticing this that every frog you dissect has some unique features if circulatory system you are dissecting its heart is missing nervous system brain is missing you are lucky that it's a frog if it was a human being they would it would go to supreme court yeah you don't take up medicine he told me so i decided i will not do medicine but already mathematics once i had drowned so i had pulled me out now that was the other option do i do mathematics how do i do mathematics i mean how many times can you ask even god to intervene in your so i was wondering what to do swami tells me hey mathematics che that sealed i went back picked up msc mpc and did mathematics today i can tell you this without an iota of pride because i know it is not my achievement that when i finished i got a university rank i was very i was very jubilant i went to swami's room and i was waiting outside swami came came me he asked me what i said swami namaskar enduku swami asked what for what do you need namaskar swami i got a rank he said mathematics lo enta vachindi he asked i said swami 90 vachindi swami he said vachi 90 adu oka mark ah he said is that a mark in mathematics you should get centum that's what swami told me and he walked away after going 10 steps he said come paapam chesko he said kemi namaskar why i am telling you this is he is sarva shakti murti he can not only do anything himself he can make you do anything you see that is the beauty when you give your life to him he makes your life such a beautiful journey such a wonderful journey that you never know that you can do such things he makes you do fantastic things when bharadwaja did yagnyam you know swami said in 1963 he asked for extension of life 100 years he had learnt vedam and he asked for extension they gave another 100 years another 100 years and then uh, indra came and told him look what you have learnt of the vedas is only three fistfuls of this huge mountain so i'll teach you a yagnyam which you can do like that when you talk about swami you can only start with a wave and end with a wave it is a endless it's a endless ocean of love it is full of uh, full of waves and there are so many waves you cannot count them so i have got a extension of and uh, 15 minutes right so let me see what should i start yeah there was a time i will skip many slides yeah it was the end of my bsc and uh, i had to choose my msc course what do i do next and there was this uh, bangalore university had a very funny uh, tradition within one week of giving your final bsc results they will say you have to apply for msc and uh, i had a big list okay msc maths i can do msc physics i can do ms ma english i can do and professor kasturi i told me you do ma journalism i will tell swami to make you uh, 
uh, editor in Sanatan and Sati because he was working in the press, my father was there. So I had got excited, I liked the English, so I thought I will do journalism. Big list. But I decided that Swami should choose. So one day, the results had come out, I was standing at this, at a staircase leading to Swami's room. It was a time when there were thousand students, students on the campus. You know, summer course was on. Thousand students, I was wondering, how do I catch Swami's attention now? How do I ask Swami, Swami, please tell me. Swami is going to give this course, Swami is going to give darshan, Swami is so busy. And among these thousand students, I am but a drop. How do I get his attention? When I thought of this, I just shed one tear. Just thinking, feeling very hopeless. Swami, how do I approach you? I just literally shed one tear. Somebody pats me on the back. There was a gentleman by name Raja Reddy. He used to be very close to Swami those days. He pats me and says, there are these boxes of apples. Will you please help me carry it upstairs? So he picked up one carton. I picked up one carton. He started walking. And he walked, walked, went into Swami's dining room. And Swami was sitting there. So I went with this carton, very excited, but totally forgot for what I am excited. For me, it was enough that Swami was sitting there and Dr. Bhagavantam was sitting with Swami at the dining table. I kept the apple box. See, you can't overstay your means. You can't take too much of chances. I had come uninvited, so I slowly was going back. As I was moving back, came to the last step, Without looking at me, Swami said, Ravi, he said. So I ran. Swami asks, asks me, Yem chestu now, he says. So before I could say anything, Swami started telling the entire this thing to Dr. Bhagavantam. This boy came to me wearing knickers, half pants, and look at him. He has got a university rank. And now what are you going to do? He asked me. The question I should have asked him, Swami, what should I do? He is asking me. I said, uh, Swami, I want you to decide. Swami said, ah, I will decide, you don't decide. He said, I said, okay, Swami. And uh, after a few days, Swami gives me interview. And Swami asked me the same question. Ah, no, I am He said. I said, no, Swami, you only should tell me. Then Swami said, in which subject you got minimum marks? Now, Normally when you go to people, they'll say, in which subject you got maximum marks? Very simple for me, I said, Swami, chemistry. Swami said, ah, chemistry chai. <laughs> so that's how I came into chemistry. And today if I am an associate professor in chemistry, this is the history. This is how I came into chemistry. Totally, I had in my big list, chemistry did not figure at all. I mean, MA Sanskrit was there, MA English was there, MA Journalism was there. MSc statistics was there, but somehow chemistry never figured. And Swami made me choose chemistry. But I didn't know at that time that uh, Swami had designed my life, like He designs all our lives. And it was only, it's now only when I look back and connect the dots, I can see uh, such a mu beautiful, uh, meaningful picture. I may take a little more time than 15 minutes because this is something very dear to my heart. I must tell you this. Please forgive me for this uh, extension. Uh, I was doing MSc. I didn't get seat in Bangalore. So Swami told me, you go to Anantapur um, PG Center and uh, write the exam. And I wrote the exam and I got a seat. As I was doing my MSc there, my own seniors had become lecturers in Prashantinilayam. See, at that time, Prashantinilayam college had just started. We didn't have post-graduation. So, Swami asked me to do it outside. So, one of the days when I came, the, my senior who was the warden, called me and said, Hey, Ravikumar, you're very lucky, yeah, he said. I said, what happened? He said, see, we wanted to put up a drama in front of Swami. It's called Kingdom of Heaven. I think I'll skip all this, yeah. 
He said, we are putting up this drama, it's about Jesus Christ's life, there's an international conference coming up. So we asked Swami for permission and Swami said, yeah, yeah, you can put it up, it's a good idea. And then Swami went through the list, who is acting as whom, and Swami showed one particular role and said, put Ravi in this role. And they said, Swami is not here, he's studying in Anantapur, 80 kilometers away. Swami said, he comes weekends, he can practice, you put him in that role. So Swami selected you for this role, he said. I didn't realize at that time that Swami had really selected me for that role, not only in the drama. So when I came that weekend, Swami himself told me, hey, I have selected you for the drama. There was one gentleman by name Christopher St. John, who was actually a Hollywood director and actor. Swami called him, told him, you direct, take these boys to Poonachanda Auditorium Green Room and let them practice. We were practicing there. When Jesus Christ, you know, he rubs my eyes okay, and I get eyesight. That is, the, uh, that is the role. That is, I'm a blind beggar sitting on the footpath. Somebody tells, hey, you know, Jesus is coming. Why don't you ask him for eyesight? And I, I run to Jesus and say, please give me eyesight. He says, do you have faith I can give you? I say, yeah, I have faith. So he just rubs the eyes and I get eyesight. This was my role. Just when Jesus Christ was giving me eyesight, through the side entrance, Swami entered. And Swami said, Sai Baba came and you got your eyesight. So, we all laughed. It was a drama after all, no? The next day when we were practicing, Swami was giving darshan and we heard claps. We continued with our drama. Again, the same point when I was getting eyesight, Jesus was rubbing, Swami entered. And same sentence, Swami said, Sai Baba came and you got eyesight. And all of us were stunned. Swami was telling this for the second time. After the scene, I went and sat next to Swami. Swami asked me, Ravi, did you hear claps some time back? He asked, yes, Swami. You know, I was giving darshan. In the darshan line, there was a girl, 18 years old, Swami said. She was born blind. And I gave her eyesight, just like Jesus gives you eyesight. And as if that was not enough, Swami added this line, Nik Kudaistan, I'll give you also eyesight. This was the third time Swami is telling me. The drama got over and nothing, I was fine. Five years later, I had enrolled for PhD, I was working in the lab. I'll abridge many of the things because there's no time to go into details. Everyone had left. There was one boy who was, who was going near the entrance who had, for lunch, when I was mixing sulfuric acid and acetic anhydride and the whole thing exploded into my eye, concentrated sulfuric acid, and I lost my eyes. I shouted, I screamed, Sairam, and this boy came running asking, what happened, what happened? I told him, see, I've got concentrated sulfuric acid in my eye, take me to the tap. Took me to the tap. There was a new building coming up next, the library building, so they had switched off the water because some plumbing work was going on. So there's no water. But in a chemistry lab, there are some 30, 40 taps. Finally, we found one tap in which there was little water. So this water, we washed the eyes. But you know, the dangerous thing is, we always teach students that you should never add water to sulfuric acid. You must add sulfuric acid to water. Because when you add little amount of water to sulfuric acid, the heat produced is too much. So it started burning even more. And this boy who was there with me, he said, shall we go to the hospital? He had to hold me by the hand because I couldn't see, took me to the hospital. And the nurse was there, asked me, asked what happened? Then this boy told, she asked, why did you bring him here? Then he said, because this is a hospital. Where else will I take him? Then she said, no, no, it's not that. See, we have only one eye doctor and she has gone to Sri Lanka for some visa problem. So we don't have any doctors here, eye doctors. So you take him to Bangalore. So this boy is asking me, shall we go to Bangalore? I said, no, no, Swami is here. I want to go for, go to Swami's darshan. In the evening, as Swami is giving darshan, this boy is giving me a running commentary. You know, now Swami has come ladies' side. He has come near the Dashavataram gate. He has come near the Sikh Bay. Now Swami is coming near us. 
and I can hear the rustle of Swami's silk robe, but I can't see him. Then some elders told Swami, Swami gave me three packets of vibhuti. And he said, Ravi, take this and you'll be all right. Take this three, ti three times for three days. Anta he said, you'll all be fine. So I was very happy because Swami had said, so I took this vibhuti three, three days. The third night, the entire packet of vibhuti I had completely taken, licked, nothing was left and uh, I didn't get my sight and I was very, very depressed. You know, from the time that I, Swami had come into my life and that Kati Patang incident, I had always had a dream. I was thinking, I should do something by which I can serve Swami throughout my life. So I had taken all my studies seriously. I said I should become a lecturer. I should work in Swami's college. And today I said, after all these years, I am in such a plight that I cannot serve Swami. Somebody has to serve me. And I felt very, very bitter. I said, why did this happen? Why did it have to happen? But anyway, I was so depressed that I slept like that only. On the chair itself, you know, in our... Vrindavan, our students know we have a handle like that for writing a writing uh, part. I slept on that itself and that whole night I had slept like that. In the morning there was a knock on the door. I said, please come in and somebody came. Looked at that boy and said, oh, you brought coffee for me? And he said, sir, what dress am I wearing? He said, I thought, what's the, what's the link between coffee and the dress he is wearing? I said, cream t-shirt, uh, grey track pant. He said, sir, you are able to see. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I could see him clearly. For a few minutes I couldn't speak. Then I decided to go for morning darshan because those days morning darshan students wouldn't go. When I went and sat in darshan line, Swami came straight to me and very sweetly said, how are your eyes, sir? Swami asked. In the happiest moment of your life and in the saddest moment of your life, the tongue does not speak. It's the eyes which speak. So I washed Swami's feet with my tears, thinking, Swami, what can I tell you, Lord? What can I tell you? If somebody gives, you drop your handkerchief, if somebody gives it back to you, you say, thanks. He has given your own handkerchief to you, and here the Swami was giving you eyesight. What can you tell him? How can you thank him? So after that, when I got up, Swami said, go to Bangalore, get yourself a pair of spectacles, always wear it in the lab, and then he said, be careful next time. The moment Swami said this, I got uh, petrified, because that means there's going to be a next time. Because I said, somebody asked me, how was this experience when you lost the eyes? When you, as it fell in the eyes, I said, very cool it was. <laughs> how can I describe to you what it was? It was like if you have glass piece powdered and you had a chili powder and you put something else, ginger, whatever, and then put it in your eye, it was as cool as that. Once you have this experience, it's enough for many lifetimes. And Swami had told me, be careful next time. So I went to Bangalore, got myself a pair of spectacles, came back and uh, I was working in the lab. My PhD was drawing to a close and there were some final experiments I was doing and suddenly the spectacles fell down and broke. Now in those days, there was that optometrist was not there in uh, Prashant and Lim. You had to go all the way to Bangalore and getting this done would take another three days. The experiment I was doing was so important that if I stopped it, three months of work would get spoiled. I would lose three months and my PhD would get pushed. So I told myself, I'll be very, very careful. Because inside I'm hearing that voice saying, be careful next time. Be careful next time. I said, I will be very careful. So I continued with the experiment. And this time it was not sulfuric acid. It was chromic acid. Sulfuric acid plus potassium dichromate when you add. It, you get a 
a dark liquid like hala hala poison, black color, fumes and all that. And I put it in a sintered, this thing, nothing was happening. So I connected a pump to it, a vacuum pump which had just come, I had not even tested it. The previous day it had come from Japan. Just connected it, nothing happened. So I went near it to see what had happened. At that time, the whole thing imploded and the acid fell in my eye. You can imagine my state of mind. It was so terribly burning, but in my mind, Swami is going to blast me now. That's what I was thinking. As the acid was coming down, it was burning the shirt. And luckily there were a lot of people around me. They took me to the tap, water was there. We washed and washed and washed and washed, 45 minutes. At the end of it, the moment they stop, it's burning again. So, this time some other boy took me to uh, the general hospital. We had to go up the hill and come down like that. The eye doctor was there and she examined me and then I suddenly saw this boy leaving my hand and going with the doctor. The doctor took him to the next room and said something. I don't know what she said. He came back to me and I asked him, what did the doctor say? He said, the doctor said everything is fine. I said, if everything is fine, it shouldn't be burning like this. Then I thought of a new strategy. I told him, see, Swami is going to ask me what did the doctor say, so better tell me the truth. And he said, the doctor said, you lost your eyes. Nothing can be done about it. She said, take him to Bangalore. Let somebody else say like that, so that no, he doesn't go into a depression that nothing was done. So, so, sir, shall we go to Bangalore? I said, no, we are going to Mandir. Went to Mandir and this time there's a big bandage over my eye, sitting in the front. Those days there was no Vedam. There was not even music. Okay. And uh, Swami comes out, those two boys, Jaya Vijaya used to come out and stand. So, Swami has come out. And Swami has turned to the lady's side, of course I didn't know all this at that time. It seems Swami saw me from the corner of the eye, turned and, hey mindy, hey mindy, Swami said and came running towards me, running. And then he said, careless boy, careless boy, I told you to be careful, I told you to be careful. And then Swami created Vibhuti, held my hand and put it in that and said, Ravi, take this, you will be fine. I was very happy. The moment Swami said that, I knew everything would be fine. You know, till that time, I, I, I was thinking, maybe I am destined to be blind. Swami has postponed it by so many years. But now I knew I would get my eyesight. And Swami said, go to the hospital tomorrow and get your, your dressing changed. Next day when I went, the doctor removed the bandage. I could see her. But she examined me with some, some telescope or something they have, some scope. She took me outside, took me inside, took me outside, took me inside and then she said, something is wrong with my eyes, she said. I said, what happened? She said, yesterday nothing was there, today your eyes are okay. I said, that's because Swami gave me back my eyesight. <laughs> to Swami who has given so much, words are not enough. But what else do we have to offer him? In fact, there is one beautiful uh, saying which Swami used, used to say in his discourses. I to skip so many. Yeah. Kanniru tappinchu sai. Sai wipes away your tears. But actually, kanniru tappinchu sai. He brings tears to your eyes. When you talk of him, how can you not be in tears? He means so much to each one of us. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, is our life worth saving? Let us make something out of our life so that the Lord's efforts will not go in vain. Let us offer our lives completely to him. That is why this program is called Samarpan. Completely we have to offer ourselves every thought, every word. Even if we do that, Maybe for hundred births, we would still not have expressed our thanks to him. But at least let us try. This entire life, let us serve him. 
After all, all that he's asking is for us to save ourselves. So this is what we need to do. And every opportunity I get to talk about this, I think is one more flower that I'm able to place at Swami's feet. I always tell Swami, I have nothing to give you except this. Please accept it with love. Thank you, Sairam.